Chapter Five of the Great K and A Train Robbery by Paul Lester Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: A Trip to the Grand Canyon. I stood pondering, for no explanation that would fit the facts seemed possible. I should have considered the young fellow's story only an attempt to gain a little reputation for pluck if in any way I could have accounted for the appearance and disappearance of the robbers. Yet to suppose, which seemed the only other horn to the dilemma, that the son and guests of the vice-president of the Missouri Western and one of our own directors would be concerned in train robbery was to believe something equally improbable. Indeed, I should have put the whole thing down as a practical joke of Mr. Cullen's party, if it had not been for the loss of the registered letters. Even a practical joker would hardly care to go to the length of cutting open government mail pouches, for Uncle Sam doesn't approve of such conduct. Whatever the explanation, I had enough facts to prevent me from wasting more time on that alkali plain. Getting the men and horses back onto the cars, I jumped up on the tailboard and ordered the runner to pull out for Flagstaff. It was a run of seven hours, getting us in a little after eight, and in those hours I had done a lot of thinking, which had all come to one result, that Mr. Cullen's party was concerned in the hold-up. The two private cars were on a siding but the Cullens had left for the Grand Canyon the moment they had arrived, and were about reaching there by this time. I went to 218 and questioned the cook and waiter, but they had either seen nothing or else had been primed, for not a fact did I get from them. Going to my own car I ordered a quick supper, and while I was eating it I questioned my boy. He told me that he had heard the shots, and had bolted the front door of my car, as I had ordered when I went out, that as he turned to go to a safer place, he had seen a man, revolver in hand, climb over the off-side gate of Mr. Collins's car, and for a moment he had supposed it a road agent, till he saw that it was Albert Cullen. "'That was just after I had got off?' I asked. Then it couldn't have been Mr. Cullen, Jim, I declared, for I found him up at the other end of the car. Tell you it was, Mr. Gordon, Jim insisted. I done seen his face clawin' de lot, and he done go into Mr. Cullen's car where the old gentleman was sittin'. That set me whistlin' to myself, and I laughed to think how near I had come to giving nitroglycerin to a fellow who was only shamming heart failure for that it was Frederick Cullen who had climbed on the car, I hadn't the slightest doubt, the resemblance between the two brothers being quite strong enough to deceive anyone who had never seen them together. I smiled a little, and remarked to myself, I think I can make good my boast that I would catch the robbers. But whether the Cullens will like my doing it, I question. What is more, Lord Rails will owe me a bottle. Then I thought of Madge, and didn't feel as pleased over my success as I had felt a moment before. By nine o'clock the posse and I were in the saddle and skirting the San Francisco peaks. There was no use of pressing the ponies, for our game wasn't trying to escape, and for that matter couldn't, as the Colorado River wasn't passable within fifty miles. It was a lovely moonlit night, and the ride through the pines was as pretty a one as I remember ever to have made. It set me thinking of Madge and of our talk the evening before, and of what a change twenty-four hours had brought. It was lucky I was riding an Indian pony, or I should probably have landed in a heap. I don't know that I should have cared particularly if a prairie dog burrow had made me dash my brains out for I wasn't happy over the job that lay before me. We watered at Silver Spring at quarter-past twelve. From that point we were clear of the pines and out on the plain, so we could go a better pace. This brought us to the halfway ranch by two, where we gave the ponies a feed and an hour's rest. 
We reached the last relay station just as the moon set, about 3.40, and as all the rest of the ride was through Coconino Forest, we held up there for daylight, getting a little sleep meanwhile. We rode into the camp at the Grand Canyon a little after eight, and the deserted look of the tents gave me a moment's fright, for I feared that the party had gone. Tolfrey explained, however, that some had ridden out to Morin Point, and that the rest had gone down Hans's trail. So I breakfasted, and then took a look at Albert Cullen's Winchester. That it had been recently fired was as plain as the Grand Canyon itself. Throwing back the bar, I found an empty cartridge shell, still oily from the discharge. That completed the tale of seven shots. I didn't feel absolutely safe till I had asked Tolfrey if there had been any shooting of echoes by the party, but his denial rounded out my chain of evidence. Telling the sheriff to guard the bags of the party carefully, I took two of the posse and rode over to Morin's Point. Sure enough, there were Mr. Cullen, Albert, and Captain Ackland. They gave a shout at seeing me, and even before I had reached them, they called to know how I could come so soon, and if I had caught the robbers. Mr. Cullen started to tell his pleasure at my rejoining the party, but my expression made him pause, and it seemed to dawn on all three that the Winchester across my saddle, and the cowboys' hands resting nonchalantly on the revolvers in their belts, had a meaning. Mr. Cullen, I explained, I've got a very unpleasant job on hand, which I don't want to make any worse than need be. Every fact points to your party as guilty of holding up the train last night and stealing those letters. Probably you weren't all concerned, but I've got to go on the assumption that you were all guilty till you prove otherwise. Ah, oh, you're joking, drawled Albert. I hope so, I said, but for the present I've got to be English and treat the joke seriously. What do you want to do? asked Mr. Cullen. I don't wish to arrest you, gentlemen, unless you force me to, I said, for I don't see that it will do any good, but I want you to return to camp with us. They assented to that, and single file we rode back. When there I told each that he must be searched to which they submitted at once. After that we went through their baggage. I wasn't going to have the sheriff or cowboys tumbling over Miss Collins' clothes, so I looked over her bag myself. The prettiness and daintiness of the various contents were a revelation to me, and I tried to put them back as neatly as I had found them. But I didn't know much about the articles, and it was a terrible job trying to fold up some of the things. Why, there was a big pink affair, lined with silk, with bits of ribbon and lace all over it, which nearly drove me out of my head, for I would have defied mortal man to pack it so that it shouldn't muss. I had a funny little feeling of tenderness for everything, which made fussing over it all a pleasure. Even while I felt all the time that I was doing a sneak act, and had really no right to touch her belongings. I didn't find anything incriminating, and the posse reported the same result with the other baggage. If the letters were still in existence, they were either concealed somewhere, or were in the possession of the party in the canyon. Telling the sheriff to keep those in the camp under absolute surveillance, I took a single man, and, saddling a couple of mules, started down the trail. We found Frederick and Captain Hance just dismounting at the rock cabin, and I told the former he was in custody for the present, and asked him where Miss Cullen and Lord Rails were. He told me they were just behind, but I wasn't going to take any risks, and ordering the deputy to look after Cullen, I went on down the trail. I couldn't resist calling back, "'How's your respiration, Mr. Cullen?' He laughed and called, Digitalis put me on my feet like a flash. He's got the most brains of any man in this party, I remarked to myself. 
The trail at this point is very winding, so that one can rarely see fifty feet in advance, and sometimes not ten. Owing to this, the first thing I knew I plumped round a curve on to a mule, which was patiently standing there. Just back of him was another, on which sat Miss Cullen, and standing close beside her was Lord Rails. One of his hands held the mule's bridle. The other held Madge's arm, and he was saying, "'You owe it to me, and I will have one, or if—' I swore to myself, and coughed aloud, which made Miss Cullen look up. The moment she saw me she cried, "'Mr. Gordon, how delightful!' even while she grew as red as she had been pale the moment before. Lord Rails grew red, too, but in a different way. "'Have you caught the robbers?' cried Miss Cullen. "'I'm afraid I have,' I answered. "'What do you mean?' she asked. I smiled at the absolute innocence and wonder with which she spoke, and replied, "'I know now, Miss Cullen, why you said I was braver than the Britishers.' "'How do you know?' I couldn't resist getting in a side-shot at Lord Rails, who had mounted his mule and sat scowling. The train-robbers were such thoroughgoing duffers at the trade, I said, that if they had left their names and addresses they wouldn't have made it much easier. We Americans may not know enough to deal with railroad agents, but we can do something with amateurs. "'What are we stopping here for?' demanded Lord Rails. "'I'm sure I don't know,' I responded. "'Miss Cullen, if you will kindly pass us, and then if Lord Rails will follow you, we will go on to the cabin. I must ask you to keep close together.' "'I stay or go as I please, and not by your orders,' asserted Lord Rails snappishly. "'Out in this part of the country,' I said calmly, it is considered shocking bad form for an unarmed man to argue with one who carries a repeating rifle. Kindly follow Miss Cullen. And leaning over, I struck his mule with the loose ends of my bridle, starting it up the trail. When we reached the cabin, the deputy told me that he had made Frederick strip and had searched his clothing, finding nothing. I ordered Lord Rails to dismount and go into the cabin. "'For what?' he demanded. "'We want to search you,' I answered. "'I don't choose to be searched,' he protested. "'You have shown no warrant, nor—' I wasn't in a mood towards him to listen to his talk. I swung my Winchester into line and announced, "'I was sworn in last night as a deputy sheriff, and am privileged to shoot a train robber on sight. Either dead or alive, I'm going to search your clothing inside of ten minutes.' and if you have no preference as to whether the examination is an ante or post-mortem affair, I certainly haven't. That brought him down off his high horse, that is, mule, and I sent the deputy in with him with directions to toss his clothes out to me, for I wanted to keep my eye on Miss Cullen and her brother, so as to prevent any legerdemain on their part. One by one the garments came flying through the door to me. As fast as I finished examining them I pitched them back, except, well, as I have thought it over since then, I have decided that I did a mean thing and have regretted it. But just put yourself in my place, and think of how Lord Rails had talked to me as if I was his servant, had refused my apology and thanks, and been as generally nasty as he could and perhaps you won't blame me that after looking through his trousers i gave them a toss which instead of sending them back into the hut sent them over the edge of the trail they went down six hundred feet before they lodged in a poplar and if his lordship followed the trail he could get round to them but there would then be a hundred feet of sheer rock between the trail and the trousers I hope it will teach him to study his Lord Chesterfield to better purpose, for if politeness doesn't cost anything, rudeness can cost considerable, I chuckled to myself. My amusement did not last long, for my next thought was, if those letters are concealed on anyone, they are on Miss Cullen. 
the thought made me lean up against my mule and turn hot and cold by turns. A nice situation for a lover. End of chapter 5